Right, Jill. I want you to, if you don't mind, I'd like you to go into this cupboard here and select five records at random. And it doesn't matter whether they're box sets. Yeah, there's four cupboards there, okay. or four, four sections. Just take five out, please. There we are. Okay. Yeah. Can't you pick some better ones? <laughs> they are. I'm looking at them and thinking these look pretty rummy. <laughs> oh, that looks okay. <laughs> Leave one more. Can you take one more? Because that one, there's a couple here that are really rubbish and oh, I can't wow. see anything about them. Why have them. you got them? Let's get rid of them. Oh my goodness. One more. <laughs> one more. I'm going to... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just shows, doesn't it? Yeah. There's a lot of space used in the house for rubbish. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Welcome to the video. Uh, thanks to Jill for picking um, half a dozen or so albums at random from my, my collection. This is my first um, first random selection of 2023, so I've done a few of them before. Uh, and it's where basically I, I'm trying to re-familiarise myself with albums that don't normally catch my eye when I'm scanning through the, uh, through the shelves for something to play. Um, so... I think, in tr if truth were known, I think uh, Jill would be happy if every single last one of my records was somehow found its way somewhere other than our house. Uh, but never mind. Anyway, the first album she picked out was by Joe Cocker. So you'll know Joe Cocker. It's called Stingray from 1976. You'll know Joe Cocker from his cover of The Beatles with a little help from my friends. Uh, and it's a, it's a hit that he never bettered. Um, he did a great version of Unchain My Heart, which I think is a Ray Charles song as well. He's not a songwriter though. All these albums are um, of uh, tracks by other artists and some pretty deep cuts as well, some obscure ones. I think this one's got a Dylan song that wasn't that wasn't released until 20, 30 years later on one of his bootleg series collections. Uh, but you've got tracks here by Bobby Charles, it's the late 50s. Um, early 60s kind of R&B type I think if I remember rightly he wrote See You Later Alligator which uh, Bill Haley did a um, couple of Dylan tracks uh, George Clinton uh, wrote a song that's covered on here and Leon Russell's most famous song A Song For You closes the album uh, this has got a bit of a, a, a reggae vibe um, he's got a bit of a who's who on here he's got Peter Tosh uh, the Upsetters. Uh, who else have we got? We got Clapton players on this. Uh, Steve Gadd on drums. Session session guy. Uh, you know, nice cover. As I say, it's got like a bit of a reggae vibe, but only in parts. And it's got like a, a really relaxed feel about it. It's um, music for late night or maybe a sunny day sitting by the beach with uh, your earphones on, uh, in. Um He's got he's got a really good voice. I mean, Joe Cocker, just like another very famous R and B singer, Bobby Blue Bland, has got this vocal tick or idiosyncrasy that's that's at first is kind of interesting and then eventually grates on you. And um, Joe Cocker's got this uh, growly. He, he, he's got a really tender voice. He can sing really really nicely. Nice. Uh, I wouldn't say smooth, but very much a, a, a soulful voice. But then when he tries to hit uh, or, or, or to signal a um, greater emotion, he, 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 he emits a growl, which is just, after a while, becomes a little bit tiresome. Um, but Bobby Blue Bland was a uh, um, early 60s, uh, although he did record right the way through, I think, until the 1980s. He was a great, great singer. I think you wrote "Ain't No Heart, Ain't No Love in the Heart of the City," which was covered by White Snake. Uh, although Bobby Bland's version is is is, is better, he's got, he developed a, a vocal tick where when he's trying to reach emotional peaks, he would like almost like clear his throat um, as if he was going to spit or something. 
<laughs> and I think, uh, you know, his agent or somebody at a record company said, hey, that's really interesting and really quite unique. So you should do that on every song. And poor, and sadly, Bobby Bland did that. When he wasn't doing that, he was a sensational vocalist. Really, really good. Anyway, this is kind of, as I say, a bit of a relaxed vibe. Um, Joe Cocker, very reliable uh, when it comes to his albums. They're all pretty much of a muchness, but very, very enjoyable. Um, but not really groundbreaking. Good. Uh, somebody who also isn't groundbreaking is the second album that uh, Jill selected, which is Jack Johnson On and On. Jack Johnson. Uh, this thing is from 2003 or something like that. Um, nice cover. You can see his uh, bandmates there um, on bass and uh, a bit of percussion, I think. Uh, very light, like percussion, but yeah, got guitar. Anyway, he's a bit of a, he's from Hawaii and he's got this, it's another one with a relaxed vibe, even more laid back than Joe Cocker. Um, I understand this guy used to be a professional surfer, uh, so he's got this beach vibe going on, definitely. Um, and it, it, it's, it's melodic, it's acoustic based, as I say, a little bit of percussion here and there. Um, utterly unmemorable, but pleasant background music. Now, there'll be people out there who absolutely love this guy, um, but for me, I just think is uh, uninspiring. Uh, even though, I, I, and in fact, I, I bought the album that followed this in between something, I forgot what it's called. And you know, that's pleasant as well, but it's the same old stuff. So uh, he's got a voice that's a little bit reminiscent of uh, Ben Harper. Uh, although Ben Harper's music is uh, much more varied and Ben Harper rocks out on occasion. But a nice warm voice, uh, but un unremarkable, not very memorable. So the third one um, was by uh, 60s prog pop icons, the Moody Blues. Now, what did, I made a few notes on this one. Um, apparently it says here, it's now 21 years since we first heard Days of Future Past, famous Moody Blues track. And of course, if you don't know much about the Moody Blues, you'll know them from the 60s classic Night and White Satin. And what they did, they, um, they're very much a pop band at the beginning, kind of R&B based, typical 60s English, English R&B. Uh, and then they morphed, I think they acquired a Mellotron, and then they morphed into kind of prog pop pioneers and they released a few albums that were, to varying degrees, pretentious twaddle, um, but but melodic and enjoyable, kind of inoffensive. And when the bad likes of uh, King Crimson and Yes, and then Genesis, uh, early Genesis came along, they kind of blew them out of the water in terms of inventiveness and, um, um, What's the word? Unpredictability. Yeah, one of the things about the Moody Blues I've always found, and this album in particular, which I think is 1988 or something, is that one of the things I like about music is, in fact, any music, but I just mentioned prog because it's kind of in this sort of genre, is that there's so many twists and turns in the music and the music constantly surprises you. And as I say, that's not exclusive to prog. It could be absolutely anything. But in listening to this album, you get the impression of, you know, great melodies, nice singing, um, fairly bland lyrics, but everything's predictable. Every track starts in its, in, in, in its own way and then goes exactly where you expect it to go. Uh, the drum patterns are metronomic, really, uh, and most of it's m slow or mid-paced stuff. And I, I don't know what was going on. I don't know why they why they decided to do this. Uh, maybe they got the band back together. I've not been a great great followers. Um, although they come from the city I now uh, live in, um, they come from Birmingham. Um, um, but there's something about. I think there's another, there's another band, the symphonic prog band called Renaissance, Renaissance with Annie Haslam as the singer. They, uh, they came a little bit later and produced these big orchestrally backed symphonic prog albums. And they also released an album in the 1980s, uh, which name of which I can't remember, but I, but I do remember listening to that and thinking, why bother? And it's almost like they, they needed to do something 
but they didn't have the courage to stick to the to what they are are really really good at. So they tried to into into to inject more pop and more of an eighties kind of sound palette to their albums. Um, and both those albums fall flat on the ass if you ask me. So this is pleasant, bland, uninspiring, and but you know to Moody Blues fans, I suppose they were some of them will have been eager to hear anything new from them. Um, here's a band that's a bit of a prog pop crossover band as well. Um, this is, I think, my third copy of Super Tramp, even in the quietest moments. Now this got an interesting inner sleeve as well so you see um, Roger Hodgson there and uh, Rick Davies over here both the, the main songwriters don't think they wrote much together they wrote kind of separately but then managed to bring stuff into the rehearsal room no doubt and they uh, supplement each other's compositions and come up with something uh, you know uh, two plus two equals five but this is a um, as I say possibly my favorite came out in 1977 uh, the big hit is the opener, Give a Little Bit, um, which is a, a Roger Hodgson song. Lover Boy sounds characteristically Rick Davis. Rick Davies. Uh, the title track, even in the quietest moments, is a longer kind of a, a prog type thing. Um, I won't go through all of the tracks, of course, but except to say that uh, the, the closer, Fool's Overture, which might be about 10, 11 minutes long. Yeah, it's got some timings on here. Look at how glossy that is. Look how I handle my records here. 10 minutes and 51 seconds long on the A&M label, Fool's Overture. Um, it's um, very dramatic. It talks about, well, it talks about, it's got little excerpts of speech from Winston Churchill. Um, it's also got some um, melodic themes from... Uh, one or two classical pieces of which I can't remember at this moment, but it's wonderfully dramatic. It builds nice and slow, and uh, you know the last section is really, really strong. And I, I, the only time I ever saw Super Trump, I think it was the only time, I had front row, Newcastle City Hall on this tour, and they had big backdrop uh, where they had some film. And when they were doing Fool's Overture, they had these pictures of Churchill and that. And it was so, so kind of exciting and thrilling and inspiring um yeah they they, they really knew how to um to do stuff um the stuff that was kind of big on drama and uh, yeah I, I do think they're a highly underrated band they a lot of people think that they don't deserve to be mentioned in the uh, prog genre and i can absolutely see that because they had this ability to write great pop songs like dreamer of course and the logical song um, but an absolutely fabulous band who managed to to uh, to, to stand astride prog and pop um, with good singing too as well so yeah great band great album I strongly recommend that one uh, moving on to somebody else who's in the uh, same vein as Joe Cocker early 70s well connected R&B blue, you know, R&B uh, soul type type vocalist, and this is Maggie Bell, Suicide Al. Um, as I say, she's another typical one who was pretty well connected in the industry. Uh, came from Scotland. Um, the first time I I heard this 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 album, and uh, sorry again, not a songwriter necessarily, although she did write the title track of this. Uh, this album, um, did she co-write it? Yeah, she co-wrote it with Pete Wingfield and three others. So um, yeah, she wasn't a great songwriter, but again, her and her team picked some great songs uh, songs to cover. Uh, but like I say, well connected, and it seems to me there must have been a bit of a a bit of a gang in the uh, early seventies, late sixties, early seventies in England, where people from around the UK often migrated to uh, to London and they must have hung out at the same pubs and clubs in Soho uh, and go, went on holiday together and trips together, toured together and they all played on each other's albums. So this album here is on Swan Song, which is a Zeppelin label. Um, those of you who haven't seen it, is that there it is. So Swan Song, Jimmy Page plays on it. Uh, so he's got a nice, nice uh, guitar solo on uh, 
one of the trucks on side one of which I can't remember. But what have we got here? Let's see if I can get this back in its sleeve. Right, okay. So it opens with a version of Freeze Wishing Well, uh, which is by Paul Rogers and uh, the whole of that. In fact, the whole of Free. Really interesting version. So not pedestrian. Uh, it's got some real, uh, real character, and it, it sounds different to the free version, but really interesting and, and good as well. Suicide Sal is a good track. Um, I was in change. Is if, if you don't know, I think is the one which has got Jimmy Page on it. Um, was it I wasn't? One of these has got also Albert Lee, the blues guitarist, on here as well, a blues rock guitarist, and he does a really nice melodic solo as well. That's really good. Um, another version of a of a. A free song, Hold On. Um, yeah, and I saw standing there a version of Lennon McCartney's, the, Be the Beatles version I saw of, uh, I saw him stand, I saw him standing there. Yeah, it's good. It's again, it's another one of these albums that you would listen to, um, you know, in the car, on the beach, late at night. A um, little bit rocky in places, but mostly kind of a nice... Um, Gentle's not the word. It, 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 it's kind of what's the? Word? I'm struggling to think of the word here. It's kind of quite calm and kind of pleasant, a little bit backgroundy. Um, so she she wasn't hugely successful, but um, you know, so stuff still sells. Still sells, I suppose. So she's su successful, a lot more successful than many. But yeah, uh, that's Maggie Bell. Uh, actually, Jill picked a couple more, so I think we might have seven here. This is Donovan, 25 years in concert. I think this was released in uh, 1991 or something. So it's 1991, what an awful cover, absolutely awful. Um, picture of Donovan, uh, no doubt how he looked in the 1960s. These are live recordings from uh, the early 1980s. I have no idea whether these appeared on an original album and this is just a repress for some uh, promo campaign but it sounds really really good very very well recorded uh, he goes on a little bit when it comes to hurdy gurdy man he makes he talks about his connections to george harrison um and i think famously donovan he's like singer songwriter i think he styled himself a little bit on bob dylan in the 1960s and i do remember there was uh, there was a clip on film and i think it might have been from dylan's don't look back where when Dylan was in the UK in uh, in the 60s, he, he kind of dissed Donovan, uh, saying he didn't know who the hell he was, basically. So Donovan revered Dylan, but obviously not the other way around. But what's surprising about this, other than the fact that he, he, he continued to produce albums, um, is that how many of these songs you recognise? So Universal Soldier, Jennifer Juniper, Catch the Wind, Hurdy Gurdy Man, Sunshine Superman... Uh, Colours, uh, boom, 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 La Lena, uh, yeah, that, and, yeah, so 15 tracks, there's at least half a dozen there that are definitely memorable. Um, what's interesting about this as well, to John Martin fans, uh, English kind of folk fans, is the legendary bassist Danny Thompson plays bass on these live recordings. Uh, so that's pleasant, probably for completists, I would go back to the original albums in the late 60s. Uh, if I was searching out Donovan. And finally, Jefferson Starship, very different. Red Octopus, 1975. Yeah, 1975 is on Grunt Records. So there's the Grunt label, there we go. 1975, now, don't know much about Jefferson Starship other than that they, um, the, the, the main people out of Jefferson Airplane and that San Francisco scene, you know, Grateful Dead and Quicksilver Messenger Service and so on. Uh, kind of psychedelic, kind of blues um, kind of combination. Um, they came out of this that same scene and Grace Lick and Paul Kantner um, kept a hold of the Jefferson name and then instead of Jefferson Airplane called it Jefferson Starship and there's Marty Balin, I think it is, who was also in Airplane, who came to join Starship, um, not initially, but uh, certainly for this album. Um, it hasn't got much of that psychedelic vibe from the um, from the late 60s, uh, 1975, and I suppose they were progressing. Um, but on side two, there's, there's a little bit of that going on. 
Um, there's a track called Sand Alphon, um, which is, uh, I think it's an, uh, it's the penultimate track. It's it's instrumental. Uh, and the final track there will be Love. They do sound like Jefferson Airplane. But this is known mostly for uh, Miracles, the second track on side one, which was a big hit in, in America. And I don't know about uh, what, what, what you think about Jefferson Starship or Jefferson Airplane, but this came out in 1975, as I've said. And I think by that time, that late 60s San Francisco thing was fading out. It might have still been selling concert tickets and albums in the United States, but it was really quite fading out in the UK. And I did see Starship, uh, Jefferson Starship, because they morphed later into just Starship in the 1980s, none of the uh, big hit singles. Uh, Jane and um, We Built This City, We Built This City on Rock and Roll, which you'll know. Um, but I, I saw them supporting um, Genesis at Neb the Nebworth Festival in 1978. Now, Genesis were headlining. It was their show. And if I remember rightly, um, we had um, Devo, who were great and got pelted. There was two festivals. Uh, one was headlined... Um, Anyway, one with Genesis anyway. The main one in June was in Genesis. And I can't, I might make a mistake here, but Devo were on one of those bills who were great and everyone, not everyone, but people pelted them with all sorts of crap from the audience. Um, also Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers at the time of the second album, uh, You're Gonna Get It. They did an absolutely brilliant set. They were great. Uh, but Jefferson Starship showed up and everyone thought Grace Slick was gonna be singing and uh, she didn't show. So the second on the bill, uh, it's starting to get dark a little. Um, you're expecting something quite big from this legendary band. And they came on and Grace Lick wasn't there. Believe it was because she was going to having drink problems at the time and she might have been drunk. And I read somewhere a while ago that she, um, um, she missed other gigs on the European tour as well because of uh, her alcohol problems uh, at the time. Um, never mind. Uh, the whole set without Grace Lake was underwhelming, um, but you know, I was going to say memorable. Memorable for its how underwhelming it was. There you go. But this is a very, very big selling album, very popular, no doubt still is in m many, many uh, album collections of rock fans in the United States, less so in the UK, but still a significant amount, no doubt. Uh, good band. I like Airplane. Uh, Starship pretty good as well, but overall this is of its time, and I think you kind of have to be there really. Anyway, that's uh, that's the first random selection of 2023. Um, I'll do another one when I get round to it. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next video. Who knows what it'll be about? See you later. Bye.